Welcome to the December 18th, 2023 meeting of the Yarmouth Board of Health. Just some uh, housekeeping here a little bit, and that would be attendance. So, Eric, are you present? Present. Just raise your hand as well for people at home. Good. Mary? Present. I'm Hillard. I'm present. Larry? Present. Okay, Charlie? Present. Okay, so Quorum Smith there. Uh, just to point out that this is a hybrid participation meeting. That means individuals can zoom in, can call in, or actually uh, attend the meeting. It's nice we see we have a group of people here. Uh, for specific information, people need to go to the website. And phone number is there, instructions about zooming in, um, how to reach the YouTube channel we have here. So a lot of ways for people to connect with us tonight. Um, the first item on the agenda, as usual, is the public comment. I would just ask if the people want to just some issues with the board um, for it not to be on the topic tonight, which is the migrant family relocation on some other subjects. Uh, we're here to listen. If anyone either here or at home has questions. Yeah, anybody's over there. Anybody there? Someone in the room? No? Are you saying you can't comment on the We're going to, okay. okay, at this moment, no. So this is just the public comment to address issues that are not related to what's on the agenda tonight. Um, tonight, yes, we have plenty of opportunity for the public to speak up, questions, comments on the migrant relocation uh, that's, that's here on the Cape or specifically in Yarmouth. Um, yeah. Am I yeah. clear? Do you understand? Yeah, as long as we have a chance tonight. Yeah. By all means, that's, yeah. we welcome that. It's great that when people show up, uh, we appreciate that. This okay. is standard that it's always for topics that aren't on the agenda, the public comment. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of opportunity, you know, for people to address the board that way. So if there are other subjects, there's a lot that we deal with, if there's anything. Now would be the time. Okay, we have anyone else? Apparently not. So let's move to item number two in the agenda. And this is our three-month update on the migrant uh, family relocation. Uh, the Board of Health has had updates, well, we have it every, every meeting uh, for the past three months. Um, just one point, there is a fact sheet on the website, which was very helpful. Uh, it was in our pack. It's hopefully, you know, we've all looked at it again. So just so people are aware of that, there's a lot of the information online. Uh, what we have tonight is actually we have a group of speakers with expertise um, that are relevant to the family relocation program here. So what I, I would like to do, we'll go speaker by speaker um, and get our presentation and then have anyone who has dialed in, zoomed in or here to ask questions or comments that are relevant uh, to that subject that was just addressed. Um, so. For the overview of schools, tonight I believe we have Dr. Mark Smith, and who's superintendent of the DY schools, which is great, and I believe we're there. I s yes, okay, just kind of raise your hand so everyone knows who you are, Dr. Smith. Great. So, why don't you uh, address the community and the board? That'll be great. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Mark Smith, superintendent of the Dennis Yarmouth Regional School District. Happy to be here. Uh, so just briefly, uh, so the school district has welcomed uh, 28 students into the K or pre-K-12 system uh, uh, who are currently residing uh, at the Harborside Suites. And students have, are well transitioned at this point into the school district um and are fully integrated into the school system uh you know transportation I was asked to speak a little bit around transportation we, we've been able to 
integrated into our normal transportation system with a fairly minor adjustment to our existing transportation you know, mechanism in that we were uh, just had to create an additional bus stop. Um, you know, 28 is obviously a pretty regularly traveled route for our school buses. Uh, so just creating some an additional stop there uh, is actually having uh, all the families located in one particular place actually made it from a transportation standpoint for us uh, as a school district easy. Uh, you know, what you can imagine logistically uh, transportation for us is a it, having all of our families spread out all across both towns is a significant logistical challenge for us. So adding 28 students that are all located in one place is actually logistically much easier than when 28 new students come and they're scattered all across both towns. So that that piece was actually 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 logistically much easier. Um, uh, trying to think what else. Um, you know, uh, we're as a school district, we're fairly well set up already to support the language needs for the students. Uh, having families for whom English is not their first language is not a new need here in Dennis Yarmouth. So we already had a significant amount of English learner staff. We have uh, family liaison positions. We have interpreters either on staff or uh, in our cadre of uh, staff that we can call upon you know uh, we have interpreters on call that we're able to call so you know once we were able to get uh, some information from the state you know it's been a lot uh, easier once the national guard was put into place to have some logistical uh, help and some support uh, to get some regular back and back and forth communication but now that we're several months in uh, communications streamline is much more consistent and much easier. Uh, our biggest initial point around communication was getting all the families. We have a communication system through a feature called Remind, which uh, translates uh, our school-based messages into native language. Uh, so we just needed a mechanism in order to help families get onto that. We were able to set families up uh, the, the families at the Harborside Suites get those families set up on that about two weeks after they were here uh, in one uh, event where we were able to invite all the families over here to the school. And once we were able to do that, uh, that helped uh, significantly in both district-wide communication and school-based and teacher-based communication. So I'm happy to answer any individual questions i do have a hard stop at six just because i have to get to my school committee meeting but i'm happy to answer any quite any specific questions so we have anyone present who'd like to to come forward any questions for the superintendent great and just for the record you just need to introduce yourself that's all it'll be helpful then you're on your own up there my name great. is eileen stars um i am wondering um how many ESL teachers were hired um, in the school system and what was the cost um, to the town to hire those teachers? And I um, also am wondering um, what testing um, was done on um, all of the children uh, for any type of infectious diseases. Okay, that was very clear. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yep. yep. So uh, we did uh, hire one additional uh, ESL staff, uh, and that came through federal and is being supported by federal funds. There's two funding streams that are supported um, support the shelter, the emergency shelter programming um, fund code. The first one is fund code F. Uh, it's three four four. I forget the the. Oh, sorry, it's fun code three four four, um, which is an upfront uh, cost of one thousand dollars per student. So for us, that equates to twenty eight thousand dollars in upfront money. And then the second is a reimbursement uh, funding system, which equates to one hundred and four dollars per day per student 
so both of those funding streams are being utilized to offset the cost of the additional staff member. Uh, and then to the second piece, uh, there as a public school, uh, you can uh, look up the, the laws and we're not allowed to deny entry for any student uh, into school. Um, so we don't run testing. That's not uh, our job. Our job is to ensure students are in school. Uh, so we require a certain level of documentation for vaccination, which we did for all the families. And, but we cannot ultimately deny anybody um, access into school for, uh, for a, w a wide variety of reasons, um, including uh, vaccination status, et cetera. Um, and if you look on the, the Department of uh, Public Health website, you'll see that uh, across Barnesville County, um, public schools for years um, have always worked with families to try to maintain uh, vaccination compliance. And as public schools, we uh, work uh, annually to try to help all families reach uh, vaccination compliance, but we don't always get there. Um, and those are all families, regardless of whether or not they're living in a in a shelter here in town or whether they're born and raised right here on the Cape. Um, and it's not a, we are not allowed to deny access um, into school uh, if they don't have all their vaccines. Thank you. Did I answer the question? Uh, given that um, s some of the migrants don't have paperwork, how could you prove their vaccinations? A uh, significant number of the migrants actually do have their paperwork. And again, uh, I'm happy to, I don't have it offhand, but uh, just do a simple search on um, who uh, is guaranteed public education, you'll find one of the, um, the the basic civil rights laws here in Massachusetts uh, ensures that every child uh, has access to public education, regardless of immigration status, regardless of race, regardless of a whole bunch of protected categories, one of them being immigration status. And uh, we're not, it's not an area that as a public school that we uh, are able to deny uh, access to public school. Just to let you know, the, the board has worked endlessly just on trying to get the public vaccinated, and that includes kids going to school. It's, it's been difficult, um, and that certainly predates this relocation program. It's been a major challenge, and it's beyond just COVID um, in the sense of the vaccinations. There yeah, I would agree. Some Families make choices topic. around vaccines, regardless when, whether we're talking about measles, mumps, you know, like this is not something that's new for schools. Um, and again, it's not something we can deny access to school. If a family chooses they don't want to vaccinate their family for chicken box, we cannot deny them access to public school. That's not our purview as a public school. I mean, this is measles, mumps, rubella, this hepatitis B involved. Um, it can go on and on with the number of vaccinations that are required and it's difficult to get all the kids vaccinated or for that matter other people in the community so it's a challenge right well I just think that the the parents of the children that are going to the DY school system would feel better to know that you know, vaccin vaccinations have been completed on the migrants, you know, because they're, they're, you know, unfortunately, the possibility that they could be bringing some, you know, infectious diseases in that have basically been eradicated in the United States, but, you know, they're, they're not in other countries such as Haiti. So um, that was my point is, you know, that I think that parents should be assured that every possible step has been taken to ensure that um, these children 
are, are properly vaccinated and properly tested so that they're not exposing their children to something unwittingly. That's, that's my point. I understand the Kinney Vento that they, you know, they have to, um, you know, put every child immediately into school. That's federal law. I understand that. But I just think that there could have been, you know, some safeguards that were taken to, to perhaps better protect the current population at the school. Okay. I think and we'll I have more information about this later tonight. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just, you know, for the sake of, um, you know, facts on the ground, roughly anywhere between five and 10% on any given year of students are not 100% vaccinated. And it's got regardless of whether that student is newly arrived in the country or not. So that's just, those are facts. And this is 28 stu students who are significantly smaller than 10% of our student population. Okay. Just yes. S Superintendent, if I could, it's Jay Gardner. Um, first of all, I appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. I know you got a compressed schedule. Just one question. Um, you mentioned you have a cohort of 28 students, but what is the universe of, of, the, of, the, of, of immigrants within the DY school? So that's a, that's a subset of how many? Uh, yeah, I really, that's a tough number to 100% put my finger on. Um, it kind of depends upon the definition um, that you're using. So there's a federal definition for which we have to report to the state. Um, and that's really, uh, and I'm not even sure why they use this definition. I'm sure it's got to do with, it's tied to, uh, actually it's a state definition, and I'm sure it's tied to federal funding at some level, um, which is a student who is, newly arrived to the country and has been here for less than three years. And I don't have that number off the top of my head. I know it was the number that I put in the press release that went out, a joint press release between the t towns. And again, I, I could put, I could, if you gave me a minute, put my hand on that number. Um, but if folks wanted to re refer back to that press release, that would be the most recent number that I had at that time. Um, but that's based upon that particular category. Oh. Um, that's as far as families that have, you know, again, it kind of depends upon what we're using as a definition for, you know, it, you know, immigrated to this country yeah. on what timeline. So I think you'd have to define exactly what term it is that you're okay. you're using for me in order to properly answer that question. I know I, I don't want to sound like I'm evading the question. Like, so if I was to use the the state specific term for somebody who arrived here. Um, who's newly arrived to the country and has been here for three years or less, then it would be, again, whatever that number was. And you'd have to give me a minute to look it up on my computer to give you the specific number, but it, I would refer you back to that press release that um, I sent out, uh, whatever that was, a month and a half ago. Super, that, yeah, I, I read that. I don't mean to cut you off. I read that today, actually. Uh, it was 162 was the number that you uh, you referenced in your uh, in your press release going back some time. So we're look, we're, so this subset is 28 of 162 that fit that category. That number may have moved since 162, but that's, that was the number you used back in uh, October. Right, and that would, like I said, that's based upon the state's definition of newly arrived in the country less than three years. Gotcha. And has been in the country for less than three years. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else, any questions for uh, the superintendent? Someone has a hand up. Okay, thank you. Who has their oh. hand up? Where's, do you see a hand? Gail. There's if, one here in the Zoom room, yeah. Linda Kimball. Looks like there is in the lower right underneath. Gail Arsenault. Up. Uh, Above and to the left of Gail, it says, is that a hand up? Mm -hmm. She just need to talk, they say. Oh, uh, say your name. G Gail, just say Gail. Gail? I just want to make sure we're not missing anyone. Gail Lawson, I'll keep hearing you. Can go ahead and talk. 
mean, she's on mute right now. There's another hand raised. Let them talk. Mm-hmm. On top of the middle. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, I am a former teacher and public school administrator, and I am a resident of South Yarmouth. And I'm just wondering if Yarmouth is doing anything as far as providing ESL services to parents at this point so that they may learn the language to better communicate with the community, everyone. Uh, Yes, so we're offering uh, through our partner at the, oh, I just lost the name, Um, the, there's a school up the street whose name I have lost. But we are offering through a partner, and then we'll be offering our own um, uh, through our staff starting after the new year. Um, and then we also have a group of volunteer uh, volunteer effort that's been put through, uh, I mean, the, a group of volunteer staff uh, that have been doing ESL lessons as well for that. that those are all adult family based, yes. Oh, okay, because I am actually a um, a former teacher and administrator, and I teach the SEI course for teachers. And um, you know, I I think I would have some um, val- uh, be a valuable resource for the town of Yarmouth. Right. Well, I, I know I if you'd love to reach out to me, I'd love to put you in touch with the right people, or if, if you want to go through the town. Um, I, I would defer that to the town, um, but as far as the school district goes, I'd love to um, love to have you email me, and touch base. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else see a hand? There's a Christopher. I know Christopher's hand was up before. I'm not sure I see it up still. There we go. Christopher. Okay, we're listening. Christopher, you can hear me. Do we have to You're on mute right now. Talk? I guess not. Christopher, you're muted. <sighs> Christopher has to unmute. Right. He's unmuted, but do we have to allow him to talk over on the right? He's already allowed. He's already allowed. He's working it in the back. Just to let you know, Dr. Smith's going to leave here in three minutes. He's got uh, some time restraints right now. So. Okay, I guess not. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for thank tonight. You. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Okay, next subject here would be communicable disease tracking. And there's a Ms. Meg Payne, who's the public health director, VNA of Cape Cod is what I have here on this sheet. So. She's here. Ms. Payne, okay, welcome. Thanks for joining okay. us tonight. So. Educate us if you can, okay? Sure, thanks for having me. So my name's Meg Payne. I'm the Director of Public Health for the VNA of Cape Cod. We serve as the town public health nurses for the town of Yarmouth. Um, So I was asked to speak to you tonight on what our involvement has been um, so far in the three months um, that the shelter has been in existence. Um, So our our primary um, involvement to this point has been with um, the pregnant moms um, on in the shelter. Um, so there are three pregnant mothers. Uh, we've provided several prenatal home visits, even some postpartum home visits. Um, 
the purpose of those visits is really um, meant to get them connected with providers um, locally and um, to educate them and support them, um, provide them with materials in their native languages. Um, we've connected all of them to a baby center in Hyannis to get the supplies that they need. Um, so that's that's really the bulk of what we've been doing at the shelter. Um, also, just as part of what we've been offering to the town of Yarmouth for many years is communicable disease surveillance and follow up with the state. Um, so we have um, an EMR, an electronic medical record system that we use to communicate with the state. It's called MAVEN. That stands for Massachusetts Virtual Epidemiologic Network. So basically, anytime um, any resident um, in the town of Yarmouth is tested for um, an infectious disease and it comes up positive, it's sent, those um, lab results are sent to the state. And then the state will send us a notification saying, um, this Yarmouth resident tested positive uh, for X, Y, Z. Uh, please investigate, collect information, gather information for us and um, report it back to us. So that's our role. Um, historically, what we see uh, throughout Barnstable County is uh, food and tick-borne disease. Um, so anyway, uh, that I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Happy to answer those. Anyone here in the room with any questions or comments about communicable disease tracking here in town? Jay? Yeah, Jay. Make, um, we discussed this, the, the board discussed this at their uh, December 4th meeting. And uh, can, can you explain uh, with certainty that, or, 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 or let me ask you this way, are there any communicable diseases right now at the, at the Harbor Suites, uh, Harborside Suites on the, on the tracking that, that has been confirmed and tested? We've had no communicable disease um, come up positive or confirmed at the site in Yarmouth. Okay. I mean, certainly each meeting, the health department has provided the same information and also via the VNA as well as the state, um, just telling us there have not been any problems with people who are infectious there at the location at Harborside. So the Board of Health has been up to date. Um, just need to emphasize that. Okay, please come up once again. Just introduce yourself. Thank I you. need stars. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, several um, people and um, articles have confirmed that there were four cases of TB found at Harborside Suites. There are no confirmed active tuberculosis cases at the Harbor Suites in Yarmouth. Okay, so it's about the semantics then that you're saying that there are no cases because you Correct. just, you didn't say active before, you just said it now. Yeah, well, we only investigate active confirmed cases. Okay. I just found it rather misleading that you said that there were no cases found. There were no okay. cases found. Can I ask? Um, just one, well, just ab about that, there, there's some confusion, I think, about TB and about active TB versus latent TB. And we do have people on for tonight, some experts, uh, just on this subject that may help clarify this for you and for the public that may have been confusing. I know we discussed this at the last border of health meeting at length. Um, I don't know if anyone was listening in, hopefully they were, and I think we explained a lot about tuberculosis and really confirming the fact that there, were, there weren't any people there, excuse me, in Harborside that were infectious or carrying, you know, tuberculosis that was at risk for themselves, people living there, or the community, and the schools, and so on. There have not been any documented cases that this board has been notified about. 
Okay, so um, you're just going out of order on the agenda then? There's still um, a representative to speak about the TBRI program then? Yes, yes, yes. I think there's several, several. Uh, three people on tonight specifically about that. Okay, okay. I thought maybe perhaps she was the only one that was going to address it. Okay, thank you. Great. And there was another hand up before. Oh, come forward, just introduce yourself. Uh, the reason I'm asking people to introduce themselves is one, for the minutes that's there, and the other, people check in, zooming in or calling in, and may have missed someone when they were up at the podium before. That's all. Okay. So, Cheryl Ball. And I don't know if the appropriate time is when <laughs> that next subject comes up on the agenda, but I guess what I'm not clear on is if it's not communicable, um, why in some of the articles or statements that we've seen come out recently, was it indicated that those who were exposed to these four cases of latent TB at the Duffy Health Center why was it recommended that the staff be tested and that anyone who had come into contact with them be tested if, in fact, there is no risk? Um, that seems contradictory to me. It's a good question, but I'm, once again, I think we're going to wait for the experts, which, I mean, we're really very fortunate to have three people here tonight coming up uh, to educate all of us and reassure us of that. Um, some other questions about other communicable diseases. This would be a great opportunity. Uh, we have someone here from the VNA who knows this very well. If I, if I could just, a couple things I do want to address, Cheryl. Um, none of that communication came from the Board of Health. So to be clear, they might have come from Duffy. None of that came because the subject matter experts that have come on are going to explain exactly that. There, um, there are over 80 communicable diseases right in in that maven system right make that that yeah. attract and those come from laboratories those come from hospitals primary care urgent care centers we have this that public health has this down pretty good the discipline of public health has been doing this for decades the system it it uh it works well and depending upon you know you say the flu is a, a communicable disease you know that is a, is a reportable disease we do nothing about it. We want to track those numbers. There are other things that Meg has to do to make sure that, and she mentioned flu, uh, foodborne, we might go into the restaurant. There's different protocols depending upon those 80 communicable diseases, right, where the, where the community might be at risk. But with certainty, and we said this in December, the board said this multiple times, and I believe uh, I was on the radio saying this, there are no communicable diseases linked to the Harborside Suites. Of those 80, where the community would be at risk, there aren't any. And I think it's going to be helpful. It's going to answer a lot of questions far beyond my medical understanding is uh, the speakers that will come up next to explain uh, tuberculosis and latent versus active tuberculosis. Just tracking of the diseases has really improved with COVID. I mean, our expertise, expertise has grown significantly at all levels. So. We have a hand up here, I believe. It's Gail. We're listening, okay, Gail. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Speak up a little louder. That's it. Good. Okay. Can you hear? Yes. Are you able to hear? Hi. Hi. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kathleen A. Godzik. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm Gail Arsenal's sister. And we are both now um, residents of South Yarmouth. And my question to, I believe it, it's Meg or um, whomever is medically on the panel at this moment, is how do you individually test um, your population for communicable diseases? What's your profile? Yeah, so I guess I don't think it's clear what my role is, but my role is kind of after the fact. After somebody tests positive, then we come in, we do our investigation, we monitor, we make sure people are compliant with meds. So I, I don't think that question, uh, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that. So yes, you're not the best person. So the next question would be, how do you prophylactically screen? Again, I don't think that's a good No, no, that's not you. That's okay. the town of Yarmouth. Yeah, yeah. No, that's not you, Meg. Town of Yarmouth. How do you proactively screen? So a lot of this is done, most of this is done through a hosp through the hospitals, the primary care, urgent care. And the three, the three individuals that are coming up next 
are experts on this. And, right, and right, right. I understand. But the whole thing is, is these individuals come to this place, and then how do you process them to then prophylactically screen that's, your profile? Th that's that's done at the state level. It's a medical response, rapid response assessment team that was put in. The, the speaker after that, Linda Kimball, who oversees the operation, will be able to talk about that as well. We don't do, we don't have any medical staff here at the health department. The health department doesn't have a, a nurse assigned. A, VNA is our medical arm. Okay, so you're accepting, you're allowing people to come in, but you as the town do not have any ability to initiate screening uh, on a prophylactic basis to protect your community. Is that correct? Okay, well, I'm allowing people. We're one of 90 communities that is part of the, the migrant program statewide, right? This is across the whole Commonwealth. We're, we're, to say that we're allowing this, we're part of a program, right, that is here in Yarmouth. Do we allow that? We don't have any medical care providers on staff. No, we do not. My second visit there, I think it was like after September 10th they arrived, it was a Sunday night. By Tuesday, the, the, the medical rapid response team was in place and they were doing assessments. Okay, okay, so where does your medical rapid response team come from? Not, it's not my, it's, that's from the state. I, I hope I'm being clear. The state okay, the has state. a rapid response team. Okay. That's so from the, the state, state of the Commonwealth, right. So the state supersedes you as the town of Yarmouth oh. for medical responsibility? Clearly, we, don't, we do not have the staff on for, we have no medical arm to, uh, to this. The VNA serves as they handle, and actually for all 15 communities across the, com across, uh, the Cape, Meg, Meg staff handles all of the uh, communic communicable disease tracking. The Board of Health answers to the state. We're not providers either. All right. So this um, Kim, uh, this person Kimball will be able to answer uh, some additional questions. Is that correct in the I, terms I, I, of the um, presentation? I, I I do, but I I really think a lot is going to get answered with this next slate that comes on, and this is from the state TB, and they're going they're going to be able to explain. And I've had some conversations with them. There were Zoom calls that that Meg was on and myself, and um, to explain tuberculosis, latent tuberculosis, active tuberculosis, um, and, and maybe educate all of us on what the risks are or aren't, what the treatment is or not. And um, I, I think it's going to be educational. So I, I would suggest, because I think we can solve a lot of this if we move to this, this next group. Okay, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Okay, so let's move along to... There's another hand. Thank There's you, another Meg. hand? Okay. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, Meg. Okay, we have a name with, okay, it's Margaret. Margaret, you have a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, I guess I have two questions. And the first is to follow up on Ms. Alternate's um, question, how do you get the screening information from the state? How do they communicate to you this information? Or do they? Hi, sorry about that, Margaret. Yeah, so um, we do communicate with the state through an electronic medical record system called MAVEN. So if somebody within our jurisdiction tests positive for one of the 80 diseases, um, we're notified and then we follow up immediately. Okay, so, you know, the, the screening that there is no information, you guys are in constant communication with the state about the screening information on the migrants? Um, not screening information. Like I said, if somebody tests positive for something, then that's when we're in communication. Okay. And then back to the original question, I believe, from Eileen about the communicable diseases at Harborside that, you know, I, I believe it's the TB is latent and I believe everybody understands latent. Can you tell us at the time of the arrival of the migrants to the harbor side how many did have communicable diseases that may now be latent 
your question is this, yeah. go ahead. I mean, we weren't involved with the screening and the testing. Um, from what I understand, there were four latent. And they like, arrived latent or they were? Confirm, yeah, somebody can confirm that, not me, but I don't know. Oh, yeah, and I think we're going to confirm that with our next set of speakers. Okay, okay. It's Thank not, you. It's really not that complicated, and I think we're all going to get educated here momentarily. Okay, yeah, I, I don't think it's complicated either, and I appreciate the answers. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands. Okay, so <laughs> third item is state TB program, and it looks like we have uh, Dr. Hashim, who's TB program manager, a Dr. Tierney, and the doctors from BIDLS, associate medical director. I don't know if that's Beth Israel, Deaconess, I'm not sure, but we'll find that out momentarily. And there's a Ms. Malensky, who's director of preparedness and emergency management. Thank you, the three of you, uh, for checking in here with us and helping with this update. So, it's all yours. Uh, great. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone. So, I see uh, uh, that uh, Karen is here, but uh, I think uh, Dr. Tierney, uh, he's traveling to Vermont, so hopefully he will be joining us uh, shortly, if, he, if he's able to. Uh, I will provide the background information about what we do at our division and uh, some uh, uh, and also more focus on the TB program and the partnership with the local board of health and then I will hand it over also to Ken to talk about the the statewide response the uh, the immigrant families and we are more than happy to uh, respond to your specific question relevant to the uh, differences between the tuberculosis disease as uh, versus the latent TB infection. Uh, so it's again, my name is Bela Hashim. I am a, a director of the Division of Global Populations and Infectious Disease Prevention, uh, which is uh, within the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences at the Department of Public Health. At our division, we provide multiple programs and services through contracted providers. These programs include uh, refugee health assessment program, a tuberculosis program, and an expanding behavioral health services to the refugees and immigrants. For example, our refugee health assessment program is a two-visit health assessment services available to refugees and to a small group of immigrants that should meet a specific criteria of eligibility as uh, stated by the office, the Federal Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement. The services that we provide through the refugee health assessment program include uh, medical screening with a focus on diseases of public health significance, uh, specifically and also the infectious disease, uh, as well as the uh, blood lead level in children. We also do uh, TB screening and provide immunization to the, to the newly arrived. We have seven service providers covering main areas of the state uh, uh, to provide this service, except, unfortunately, the South Shore. Uh, most of the clients choose to receive primary care services uh, with their refugee health assessment site. We are in the process of procuring for the refugee health assessment program services, and I think it would be great if a healthcare uh, uh, provider from South Shore will join our network. Uh, so if you know of any, please suggest them to submit a proposal. Hopefully the, the procurement will be live uh, this coming January. For, for the TB program, our statewide TB program operates through really strong partnerships with other, with other divisions and offices within our Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences at the Department of Public Health, as well as in partnership 
with our contracted TB outpatient clinics, uh, state hospitals such as Lamont Shadik Hospital, school nurses, and certainly with the local board of health. Um, we use a multidisciplinary team approach in managing uh, TB disease, and our team consists of public health nurse advisors, epidemiologists, and community health workers. Our team work closely with local board of health to follow up and provide advices on TB management, contact investigation, and provide advisories, resources, and recommendations. As, for, as an example for what kind of direct case management support we provide, we provide initial and ongoing assessment, monitor for adverse reactions and adherence, uh, monitor for improvement, as well as providing uh, in partnership with local board of health, uh, the direct, directed uh, observed therapy. We provide appropriate education and information, and as well as we verify completion of therapy. And uh, Meg mentioned a couple of times the MAVEN system that the department uh, uh, own, uh, maintain, and uh, provide access to all uh, stakeholders to ensure that all infectious diseases, including tuberculosis, whether in, in both forms, whether in TB disease or, or whether in latent uh, TB uh, infection, will be reported uh, to us, uh, to our team, so they can work in partnerships to really follow up on every single individual to make sure that they have the support needed to uh, continue throughout the management uh, uh, plan. Uh, some uh, examples for our indirect case management support, we provide uh, consultation and support for local body of health. Uh, we provide consultation to clinical providers and inpatient facilities. Uh, we also provide consultation to correction facilities and we review nursing assessment, discuss update and changes to care plan, assure patient has access to treatment, and we collect and verify data that is reportable to the uh, Center of Disease Control, and for tracking patient care and disposition of contacts. Uh, our website uh, really contain uh, very, very helpful resources that we have devised to the public as well as to, this, uh, to the healthcare providers. So please, uh, I encourage you to visit our website. We even have video about the uh, tuberculosis and we have tons of resources to patients and providers uh, alike. Uh, and uh, with that, I don't see Dr. Cheney here, but I hand it over to Karen and then uh, to go over the statewide uh, response and then maybe we'll go back and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Doctor, and good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Molesky, and I'm the Director for the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Management at the Department of Public Health, and just wanted to share some background information on this overall response and the work that the department has been doing to support it from a, a public health perspective. Um, so I'm sure it won't come as a surprise to any of you that the Commonwealth is seeing a tremendous growth in demand for our emergency assistance shelter system for families. And that's really both from current Massachusetts residents as well as newly arriving families to the state. Um, families are being sheltered in various sites across the state, um, more recently in what we're calling supplemental shelter sites. And those are sites um, in hotels that don't have a shelter provider, but are being supported by the Massachusetts National Guard. Um, and there are 52 of those sites currently across um, across the Commonwealth. Um, and as we're talking about one of those tonight in Yarmouth. Um, you may have heard um, earlier this fall um, that Governor Healy determined that Massachusetts would be reaching its emergency assistance um, program capacity for sheltering families when the state reached 7,500 families. Um, that did occur in early November, and at that time a wait list was initiated. Um, and just for context, I wanted to, to let you know that at this time we have about 300 families who are currently on that wait list and unable to be offered shelter in the emergency assistance system. 
um, as this was all beginning, um, as it was beginning to expand, I should say, um, this spring and early in the summer, um, the Department of Public Health um, activated our emergency operations plan, and we put in place an incident command structure to be able to support the public health aspects of this response. While the specific emergency assistance program and the sheltering system is housed within the um, Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, or HLC, um, DPH was concerned with the public health aspects of this. So we've been deploying nurses, you've heard them re referred to as the rapid response team, um, to all of the shelter sites. Um, and what they do is they conduct a health assessment of the families, and that's based on CDC guidance of their uh, refugee assessment. And then we work based on that assessment to connect the family with needed care. So as an example, um, pregnant persons are connected with prenatal care um, as part of this work. Um, DPH is also working to enroll eligible families in nutrition programs like the Women and Infants and Children program. We're working to translate um, vaccination records that are brought with the families um, because they often come in other languages. Um, and once those vaccine records are translated, then we um, upload that information to the state's um, in, uh, immunization program. It's called MIIS. Um, and then we're working with local boards of health and with the um, um, the healthcare community to plan for catch-up vaccination, if that's indicated for any of the um, children, as well as COVID-19 and flu vaccination for um, adults and children. I think I will um, stop there and hand it um, back over. Thank you. Uh, I don't see uh, Dr. Tenney is here, but uh, I will uh, answer the question relevant to the really the latent TB infection versus the TB disease. So the tuberculosis is uh, caused by a mycobacterium uh, uh, that is specific really to, uh, to that cause the TB disease. But not necessarily everyone that will be getting the infection will become infectious or contagious. So for those who will be getting infected with the with the uh, with the uh, TB germ, then they will their immune system will be really trying to put that germ. Uh, in a dormant stage, that means the mycobacterium TB will not be really replicating or causing any harm to the uh, host body. Um, and that condition considered the latent TB infection when the individual really do not have any signs or symptoms and do not pose any risk of uh, having that infection, infection transferred to someone else. Uh, despite that fact, our protocol at the, at the department and our division as well is to ensure that even those with latent TB infection will be connected to a care. And that care will be either through the, their primary care or uh, of their uh, children through pediatric uh, to ensure that uh, they will be receiving the uh, recommended treatment. And we will provide a follow-up from our side, as I mentioned earlier, through our team, either through the public health nurses to provide consultation and guidance, and also our medical officer to answer any questions comes up from the provider side, and our community health workers to really provide support and resources uh, to the patient. And in, even in the uh, cases when they won't be able to go for their appointment, we provide also transportation support. So that's for the latent uh, TB infection. And most of the uh, TB infection is latent. Only there is around 10% uh, 
turn uh, that state of latent infection could become active or it become a, a, a TB disease. And uh, there's differences about using the active uh, disease versus, uh, versus just a TB disease. But uh, really, it, when you see it in our regulations, because part of what the uh, department does as well is to really uh, uh, issue regulations uh, for uh, different uh, uh, programs, including the, the TB program. And with that, we use the active to differentiate it between latent, for example. But it's only 10% of latent TB infection could convert to become a TB disease. Uh, whether what TB disease means, uh, would this mean that the, the a large group of population will be uh, at risk uh, in order for people to contract the mycobacterium TB really require a long period of time of contact to get the infection. But in any case, we take uh, any, uh, any infection, whether it's latent or whether it's TB disease, uh, very seriously. And that's why I think uh, all of you here having questions about on all of us having already regulations, advisories coming uh, from our department and coming also from the federal government through the uh, CDC. And we have the really uh, uh, our teams that work very closely with local board of health and with other healthcare providers that whenever we receive notifications of uh, a positive test, uh, our team in, in the same day will be con uh, uh, connected to the healthcare provider and follow up getting all the necessary information and our public health nurses connect with the, with the medical team at the healthcare provider to ensure there is a health uh, uh, a management plan and ensure the person will be assessed not only based on their medical needs, but as well as based on their social needs to ensure there are really minimal to none obstacles uh, that could uh, stand in, a, uh, uh, in the front of their path toward really full recovery uh, through uh, engagement uh, with our providers to receive the, uh, the treatment. Uh, and with that, does this answer a question or you have any other questions about latent TB versus uh, TB disease? Well, well, doctor, you know, the person who has the latent tuberculosis does not have any symptoms. Perhaps you exactly. can contrast that for us, give a description of what a person who has active TB has, what, you know, what symptoms and signs do they have? Sure. So the symptoms uh, that the the person with TB disease would have is uh, high fever, night sweats, uh, sometimes uh, rigors or shivering, uh, and when it is when it's undefinitely coughing, and the coughing uh, could start as a dry coughing and then become productive coughing, and the productive coughing that what we use uh, uh, to collect uh, sputums from these uh, targeted uh, uh, individuals to uh, to do culture and sensitivity as well as we uh, do genetic testing as well as to ensure there's if these uh, uh, bacteria for example are, are completely sensitive to all the available uh, TB medication um, and in addition if left really for a long period of time then uh, it will uh, lead to loss of weight. Uh, so uh, and uh, so that's mostly for all the TB disease. And there's one thing that I, I didn't mention. Not all TB disease are really pulmonary disease. And pulmonary, that means affect the lung or affect the upper respiratory uh, tract. That means in the larynx or in the mouth. Uh, because only uh, the TB disease that really impact the lungs and the upper respiratory infection could be 
causing uh, uh, RS uh, becoming infectious, but uh, there is really a good number of cases that they are not pulmonary, but rather they are extrapulmonary. That means the disease will be uh, reactivated in, in any part of the body, uh, for example, uh, any of the internal organs mm -hmm. or even the skin or uh, the head, except just except the hair and nails could be in any part. So for the for the TB disease, when it is exapulmonary, it's also similar to the latent TB infection, does not pose any risk of infection to anyone. Uh, the only uh, 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 possible uh, individuals that could be infectious is only for those who have pulmonary TB and they are symptomatic. That means they have really pro productive cough. Uh, that was clear. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Anyone here have questions? It's a great time. We have the experts here. Just come up and once again, just introduce yourself. Thank you. Cheryl Ball. And um, I just want to understand exactly what the process is, because what's really not making a lot of sense to me is when is all of the screening being done? Because okay. we had this group of migrants at the harbor side, they arrived on September 10th. And now we're just hearing about some screening that's being done as recent as a few weeks ago. So why isn't that screening done ideally before they arrive here? And if not before they arrive here, immediately upon their arrival, it seems like you know there's some kind of delay that's happening as far as when the screening is being done. Uh, excellent question. So thank you so much. Uh, so this is partly why we have the Refugee Health Assessment Program, which is the other program that I talked at the beginning about, because really there are two levels of, of medical screening. There's the overseas medical screening, when people, they go through that screening, and then they will there will be second level of medical screening, which is called the domestic medical screening, or in our state, we call the refugee health assessment program. The, the difference is this happened usually for certain group of immigrants. So it, it happens, for example, refugees that they are coming from overseas, they have to go through the overseas medical examination. There is a category called the special immigrant visa holders from Iraq and Afghanistan. They have to go through that uh, medical screening, as well as a lot of immigrants that they are uh, uh, submitting application, uh, visa applications. They need to co complete a medical examination overseas before they come here. And only for a fewer group, we uh, at our department for to the refugee health assessment program, we provide the domestic follow-up screening for overseas refugees, especially immigrant visa holders from Iraq and Afghanistan, and also for some folks who received their immigration status uh, at the U.S. And the, this include Cuban Haitian entrants, uh, asylees, as well as human trafficking victims. Those individuals, whenever they will be receiving um, a letter uh, from USCIS that their immigration status has been approved, then they will be uh, connected uh, to our program and we provide refugee health assessment program to them. So that's the standard process. What happened is uh, uh, in, in, in a situation as uh, the state uh, really uh, try to provide uh, a response to is when there will there were an increased number of arrivals that they are not coming through the regular uh, process of having the two level of medical screening either the overseas plus the domestic or at least the domestic so those individuals, since they are not coming through a standard process or are, and also they are not coming through, uh, through a specifically designed program through the federal government. So, for example, the, the humanitarian parolees for uh, Haitian, uh, for people from Cuba, Haitia, uh, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, 
Uh, they are coming to a sponsorship program, but the only requirement that the federal uh, government provided uh, as uh, a condition for their resettlement in the state, they need to provide attestation that they have uh, uh, received a tuberculosis screening within 90 days. And, and that's why I think a good number of, of, of those, they are really uh, calling uh, our department and we connect them to a screening uh, through uh, a contract that we have with the Quest Diagnostics. Uh, so for folks that they are going through the, really the emergency uh, uh, assistance shelters, as Ken mentioned, really, uh, although there were no standard requirement or standard process for uh, providing screening to those individuals, but the state also with the available uh, provided that support through, uh, as you know, those people, they are not coming only with the with infectious disease uh, concerns, but all, also some of them, they are uh, really pregnant. Uh, some of them, they have chronic medical conditions. Uh, so with all that, I think the state uh, did its best to provide uh, the immunization also, to, and, and to some level also we started uh, providing uh, TB screening. Uh, to some sh shelter site as well to ensure that at least the children with the who are uh, school ages and they would be able to enroll in school and although and, and, and I think I hear it also from here so everybody know that this is not, this is not a condition for them that to prevent them from enrolling in school but it is all it is important for uh, to ensure that they will be having that screening and getting the necessary immunization when they are enrolled in school. And the main objective really to have those folks to receive all that care through a primary care. So uh, we are trying uh, uh, in addition to really meeting the, uh, the essential needs of those uh, families and definitely in partnership with the local government, uh, including local board of health, I think uh, uh, all in all, we're trying to uh, stand for, uh, to really ensure that those folks, they are receiving uh, the care needed and as well as will be, uh, we, we ensure that even if there is a medical condition of public health significance, that we have all the tools and resource uh, available to ensure that people will be identified early and uh, connected to care and receive the, the support needed to go throughout the, the therapy. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have a question from Gail. Gail? Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for that person that was just there. Like, is there any um, documentation that the public can access for the people who at who are at the harbor side uh, resort at this point? Uh, so, uh, as you know, for the 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 privacy rules, uh, I'm sorry. No, nothing. I'm a, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. You're going to say HIPAA. <laughs> for sure. So, so you know. I mean, right. So, but it's, so, it's just it's just like a little. It's a little. I think. Person. But rather, no. I think it's important. I think. I think what's important really is. Do we, as a state department of public health, or the local board of health, or other stakeholders, really we are providing all necessary resources and information and ensuring that people are identified early, yes. connected to care. Right. So that's what, what we are doing really. And, and rest assured, as uh, 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 Director Gardner mentioned earlier, there are no uh, cases linked uh, to, the, uh, to that site. Uh, okay, and, now my question to you is, yep. you make, made the statement that 10% of the latent uh, TB conditions can become be. active. Yes. Yep. 
And yep. so how, what is the mechanism of uh, preventing um, that from happening? Yeah, or what causes exactly. um, a conversion? Ah, what causes a conversion? Very great question. So what causes uh, any, any condition that impacts the immune system of the host will rend, will give the opportunity for the bacteria to become uh, uh, active again. So it will be reactivated and multiply and cause the disease in whatever local tissue uh, is available in. Uh, so, for example, if someone have uh, contracted, uh, for example, HIV or uh, another, uh, for example, leukemia, uh, so or another cancer that could impact the, the immune system, or they receive an immunosuppressive therapy for... Or uh, corticosteroids exactly. or whatever. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so all these conditions really, or even uh, chronic renal failure, for example. Right. So all these uh, conditions could uh, make uh, uh, the immune system weaker and... Uh, and then later on, the, the bacteria will be activated. So for that reason, we take uh, a, treat, a treatment of latent TB infection really seriously. And that's why we are uh, providing all these uh, uh, team support, the surveillance, the epidemiology, the nursing, as well as community health workers to ensure. And uh, community health workers, all of them, they are bicultural, bilingual, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are really multilingual to ensure that we build up a trust with those uh, patients and we ensure that they are following it through their uh, treatment plan. And then I just want to let, tell you one more thing, which is really assurance, assuring I, I found it for you, and that's all those individuals coming here uh, for resettlement. That means they want to become uh, 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 a permanent resident. And in order for them, to go through the uh, the uh, adjustment of status, they need to go through a sp uh, really also same uh, screening and immunization check to ensure that those folks have the necessary screening and they receive all necessary immunization before they will become uh, eligible for adjustment of status. So there is also uh, SAQ points to ensure that folks will be doing what's what's needed to ensure that they are healthy as well as we ensure that communities are safe as well. Now, okay, so then with the four that are in Yarmouth, the four individuals, um, do you have, uh, what is your protocol? Do you um, sure. assess their health every three, six, nine months, or is it just symptom-based? So uh, basically, whenever someone, at, at this point, uh, I don't have more information about that. I think uh, my team does. Uh, but at this time, it's, it's, it's just a positive test. Positive test doesn't mean anything unless we follow up through a full evaluation. So right. when someone have a positive test, then uh, and just to let you know, the test, although we are doing and we will continue doing the screening, but although some of the tests are could provide a false positive. False positive, yeah. that means the person could have a, a positive test, but in matter of fact, doesn't, doesn't, ha doesn't yeah. have the patient. Get it. So for that reason, uh, with the, the T, with the just uh, a blood test that is positive doesn't mean anything for us, but rather those individuals, they are connected to a full evaluation. Uh, that include the chest x-ray. Chest, chest x-ray. Yeah. Yep. And, and symptoms and medic uh, and uh, uh, clinical examination to ensure that they don't have any uh, any yeah. issues that could uh, pose a more uh, more serious investigation. So, for mm -hmm. example, if everything looks fine, their chest X-ray look normal, they don't have any signs and symptoms then they, the condition will be uh, uh, considered as latent TB infection, and then they will start the treatment. And in our website also, we have all these methods of uh, treatment for latent TB infection. 
Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, with the latent that they've been uh, defined as latent TB, now do you have a protocol where you reassess, like, on a, a timetable? Okay, sure. So just want to say, I can, I can double check, but uh, the, the information that I had at that time is, is it a, a just a positive test. That means I'm not very sure about the, what's the findings of the follow-up. But okay, my understanding so then... just if, but the what's what's we have in a place. So as I mentioned, so for example, let's say one of the individuals is uh, with a positive test, then we are connected that person to our uh, TB clinic, and our TB clinic they will do a chest X-ray for them, uh, okay. clinical examination. Then they will decide this is a latent TB infection. Then the clinician will provide different options for treatment for latent TB infection. Would you go by three months, or you want the four months, or the six months? And then the person will uh, will decide on uh, on that. And then they will uh, have that information ready for us on Maven. And we have our epidemiology team and our nursing and our community health workers. We have every single week, we have a case review and we have a cohort review discussion. We go over each case and uh, uh, decide uh, or what would be the next step to ensure that the person, his or her medical needs, as well as any social factors that could impact their uh, compliance with, with the therapy being addressed very well. And we, we will ensure that they will go uh, through the, uh, the uh, treatment plan uh, and when, when, so the person would not be considered uh, completed the therapy unless our uh, partners indicated that the person has completed the therapy and we have that documentation on our Maven system. So yes, yeah, so, so that so I understand that, but I'm just saying. So now, has that been documented <laughs> and that has that been impl implemented for the for um, sure. yeah, town of no no definitely. for the town of South Yarmouth? Has that been instituted at this time? Definitely, there's no doubt in my mind. All the cases, as I mentioned, so just imagine. Well, that's, any, uh, that's uh, yeah, I understand, but I just want to make sure. And then, who would be the point person? to um, reference back to, to ensure um, if I had follow-up on that, that I wanted to uh, make sure was happening, who would be the point person in this? I, th I think the best, po the best point person will be the local board of health, your local board okay. of health. So that because be as you, yeah, because yeah, as you know, one. just that's kind of, I just want to kind of clarify one important thing, because as you know, no one of us either uh, the state or the local board of health will provide any information specific to a client. Uh, I understand per se. that, but I just but want rather to know that a general, a general. I think a general. Uh, we try. So, for example, we try and really to. So, when you go on our website, so you will have even data set available for uh, uh, condition uh, cases. For example, uh, in in each different part of the state, we have it through okay. five years. But okay. also we have uh, each year uh, the number of cases and number of suspects and what all that's break down by age group, per US born, non US born, um, all that information available on website. And we're trying our best to have this information more readily available uh, uh, to the public. But again, that will be numbers. And as you know, if you are a medical doctor yourself, yeah. so you know it's a, it's a no one will share any information about anybody. No, I understand. I understand yeah. the specifics. I, I appreciate. I just want to know what the protocols are that they are in place and yeah. that they are being followed regularly and monitored. For sure. Um, and that we have the um, town of Yarmouth has access via the Board of Health. That's my understanding to make sure that these protocols are in place and are enforced. Thank you very much. Sure. You're welcome. Okay, anyone else? Oh, we got a couple more here. Fine. Uh, we have a name there with a hand up. That's Christopher. Christopher. You need to unmute yourself. 
Christopher. Why don't you come up instead? Just come up and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Joyce Flynn, and I live in South Yarmouth. Um, I had no skills to be able to help any of the people involved with this, and it seemed that being dropped in some place help, helpless where you never expected to be is kind of the essence of Christmas and the essence of Moses in the Reeds and a lot of our favorite stories. But we now have the internet, so I was able to get um, bilingual Creole, uh, Haitian Creole uh, English books for the kids, and so we have a bunch of them here, and then uh, two novels for the teenagers and the grown-ups. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Jay, you'll coordinate that over there. I certainly will. And actually, your your next speaker is going to be able to. Uh, you know, the next speaker will be able to address this as well. Okay. I think there was another hand or two up. Great. Come on up again. <clears throat> Frequent flyer, <laughs> Eileen Stars. Um, I wanted to try to um, get clarification from what the doctor said. Um, he, I believe that he said that. The testing for the migrants can either be through the rapid response team or they can opt to have testing done with their PCP. Is that correct? For this group, yes. For this group, yes. Uh, because as I mentioned, they didn't come uh, uh, through really a regular process that I mentioned before, overseas medical screening or through connected to uh, through our refugee health assessment program. And uh, just uh, kind of re-emphasize on the refugee health assessment program. I think uh, uh, based on my experience that most of those individuals will be really eligible for our refugee health assessment program as Haitian entrants, because most of the individuals there are from Haiti. And from my experience, uh, uh, I. I used to work for settlement agencies and also I served at Chivo staff with, for the office for refugees and immigrants. And uh, I know that most of the individuals are eligible as Haitian entrants. Uh, I think if there will be uh, more uh, health assessment site available, we'll be able to uh, really connect all those folks uh, through uh, the, our regular health assessment program. Uh, so. Unfortunately, it, uh, we have only seven sites, so that's why, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are procuring again. And if you identified any healthcare provider willing to be part of the network, I think that would be great. This will help a lot to uh, to ensure that all those folks who are eligible for services will go through the uh, standard screening and our health assessments is really more comprehensive uh, screening. Uh, but definitely, uh, this is um, just to add about the latent TB infection. Uh, the latent TB infection, as I mentioned earlier, it's the person who's really asymptomatic, that means doesn't have any symptoms and does not pose uh, a risk to anyone. anyone. So that's why I think one of our uh, our uh, approach, uh, and we already starting it, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, include more and more primary care providers to be able to provide TB screening and also provide management for the latent TB infection because it is uh, really simple. It's just a blood test uh, for those who per age appropriate and some of them they require skin test. And then the uh, treatment is really uh, uh, one of the three different options uh, that will ensure that even those that even they have 10 percent of becoming active, they they will be recovering fully uh, from that infection. OK. Um, so basically, um, I'm wondering then, is the testing essentially voluntary? 
So definitely testing are voluntary, except as I mentioned earlier, for those, for example, who are coming uh, through the uh, two things I, I kind of remind you about. One is for those who are coming through the humanitarian parole system a program, they have to attest that they have uh, received uh, immunization and TB screening within 90 days. So it's a requirement for them, for those who are coming through the humanitarian parole program. And the, the, the second point is all those folks will become permanent resident. And in order for them to adjust their status, they have to go through that screening to ensure that they have done all the uh, necessary screening and they have received all necessary immunizations for the I ACIP guidelines uh, before they will allow them to submit an application for adjustment of status. So there are really some systems and check points to ensure that everyone will be uh, screened and receive the necessary immunization. Okay, but they do have 90 days. Correct. Before they have Definitely. to do that. For sure. Yeah. Okay, so, well, and, so basically and, and they could be infectious and infect no, others during that 90 days. I that's, think that's was all I was trying to understand. No, I think that's what uh, Karen mentioned uh, earlier, really. Uh, it's uh, that we have our uh, different contract vendors, and Karen, if you want to add more information about that, uh, that able nurses going to these sites and doing the check and answering questions. If, if anybody is symptomatic, uh, we have our the EA uh, uh, site uh, uh, provider or these uh, contacted nurses will let us know that someone has symptoms and will be going through really rapid screening. Uh, Karen? That's correct, yes. Um, so when a site comes online, when sites were coming online before we reached our cap, um, we would deploy our rapid response team nurses to conduct a health assessment on all of the families. Um, and then based on that assessment, connect the families to the care that they need. So then you're saying that every person at Harborside was tested by the rapid response team because there's conflicting information here. Yeah, was assessed. Assessed, yes. Was assessed. But not so, tested. Uh, because as you remember, yeah, the, the, the thing is, it's really if someone is infectious, should be symptomatic. There is no one with TB is asymptomatic. There isn't right. such a thing. You need to have cough and really a kind of cough with the productive in order for, for, for the person to become infectious. So any coughing, uh, uh, this is a high alert, not only for the TB itself, because as you know, other, other respiratory tract infections, including COVID or the flu or, or, or you name it, uh, could uh, impose risk to the resident of these uh, shelter sites and the state responsible for that. That's why it's a, it's a high priority for us to have uh, uh, assessment, rapid assessment for any coughing and ensuring that folks are, are fully evaluated. Right. I just think that if you have it, you know, voluntary for 90 days, you're dealing with a population that's in a strange country and they perhaps may have a fear of being deported if they are found out to have an infectious disease. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's a bit of a problem with, with the testing. It's, you know, maybe not so rapid after all. Thank you. No, I, I just kind of, just kind of reemphasize on one thing is really important. Unless you are symptomatic, you are not posing any risk. If you are, if you do not have symptoms, even if you have the TB germ, let's say even in theory, then you wouldn't be an infectious to others. So that's why I say, I think we are emphasizing on the importance, symptoms, symptoms are really key. So that's why we have our nurses on site uh, uh, and also our partners letting us know if someone have that symptoms, we will do a full investigation. And as you know, all of us, we wish we have uh, 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 more bigger capacity, but as you all you heard about the uh, the 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 really the increased number of arrivals during short period of time, this definitely imposes uh, uh, pressure on all systems. 
Uh, and uh, as far as the 90-day requirement, as I mentioned, this is uh, coming from the federal government requirement uh, 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 as uh, a condition for the parole program. So it's not from the state. Um, I have a question for Ms. Molesky, please. Um, yep. So after the nurses do the assessments, if they identify somebody with some symptoms that seem suspicious for perhaps an infectious disease, you said they refer them to care. Is there any further follow-up to be certain that they received that care? Sure. So, so we connect them with the level of care that they need, whether that's at a community health center. If they have more of an urgent issue, it could be at one of the urgent care centers in the area. Or if it's acute, an acute emergent issue, it could be a hospital emergency department. Um, but the rapid response team nurses do do the follow through with the clinicians um, to make sure that um, they know what the patient's status is and then what the follow-on directions are. Do the patients need medications? You know, and how are they going to get those prescriptions? Do the patients need follow-up appointments? Do they need transportation to them? They, you know, they, they help support all of those wraparound services for the families. Okay. okay and the, the second question, um, primary care providers include community health centers correct that that the patient may be referred to i i don't think i can understate what an important partner our community health centers across the commonwealth have been in supporting these families thank you uh anyone else we have someone at home margaret margaret there's Margaret. Great. Unmute, Margaret. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so I, this is a question I guess I'd actually like each member of the board and each of the state reps to give an answer if you can. Within the past few weeks, there is a communication by the Duffy Healthcare, mm -hmm. and they sent that communication to Representative Zaros um, Flanagan and digs with the CC to seer. Are you aware of the contents of the, that communication? Thank you. Did you hear the last part of the sentence? The question? Are you aware of the, the, are, are you, are you aware of the contents of the uh, communications from the we Duffy? We were informed of that. We were informed of that, yes. Do you know the contents? Look, where it came from? Or the contents of the actual content get the communication the actual no the actual contents of from what duffy is sent to the representatives no have you seen that no that was not no. sent to us no it wasn't copied to us no you didn't get it i right? certainly that no. we were informed that was from the the health department but no we didn't receive that information anything specific or in writing at all i didn't know they had contacted those people i hadn't heard that even i heard it through the media Okay, thank you. And did the um, state reps that are on the line, did they, or do they know the contents of that communication? Uh, myself, I have, uh, I'm not aware about that, the content itself, but uh, we have received uh, questions from Representative Sire office and we have uh, provided response and similar to what we have provided uh, this evening to you. Thank you. Any other state reps? Now, in, in my role as Director of Emergency Preparedness um, for the Department of Public Health, I'm not involved in um, the clinical aspects of the care of these families. Okay, thank you. I think someone else had their hand up. Uh, great. Hello? Oh, can, can you hear me? Just, just a moment, Christopher. We have one other person ahead of you. Oh, forgive me. Cheryl Ball. Um, I know we're here to talk about the <clears throat> Harborside and the Yarmouth um, concerns. I was also wondering, however, if we could get some information about any TB cases that have been identified at other migrant locations, in particularly Joint Base Cape Cod. I know that has a large number 
of migrants housed there, and Toby Hospital, I believe, is the hospital that's been treating um, residents from that location. And I was curious how we can get information on what's happening there. Well, certainly this Board of Health would not have that information, does not. Certainly the Health Department, I don't think we have the specifics of that either. Um, so you may need to go digging a little bit um, from the state information. Um, I don't know if it's there, the specifics of it. So well, should be able to answer this. Meg, are you still with us? Hi, yes, I'm here. Um, there are no confirmed TB cases at Joint Base Cape Cod or the Eastern Inn. Okay. Thanks, Meg. Could be any more specific than that. Great. Meg, thank you. There were 153 cases, I think, of TB in Massachusetts last year. Is that correct, Dr. Hashem? Something like that? Well, that's so we're not accurate. seeing a lot of TB in, in so, Massachusetts. So, yeah, definitely. So last year is 153. Uh, this year, before even the immigration, uh, the increased number of immigrants, we already uh, we were uh, expecting that the number would increase because the, the 153 on the year before, it, it's an uh, unusual low number of cases due to the pandemic. And as you know, because of the pandemic, there were uh, really uh, extensive uh, measures and some folks maybe they were, uh, uh, didn't report in, in, the, in the timely manner or, or whatever the reason is, but I think mostly it's due to the uh, additional precautions. So that made the, uh, the uh, low number of cases, but we expect that the number going back to the prior pandemic uh, this year. Christopher. Yes, can you hear me? Very clearly, yes. Great, thank you so much for your patience. Um, yes, I first of all would like to thank the board during the prior meeting two weeks ago, you discussed latent uh, TB and you compared it to chicken pox, which generally people get when they're children, which then can lay dormant until they're older, and then that's when it uh, comes back as shingles. Um, I guess uh, the question is, you know, we wouldn't want this to happen, but what would the policy be? What would you notify the uh, public immediately if a school child in Yarmouth were diagnosed with active tuberculosis? Dr. Hashim, you want to take that? Uh, definitely. So, uh, if there will be any any uh, contact investigation, uh, our our team will be working very closely in partnership with local board of health, and we do uh, really uh, specific every week uh, meeting to ensure that uh, uh, the 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 response is up to par per our protocol for the contact investigation, and we and if needed based on that investigation, if needed, we will be offering uh, uh, on-site uh, TB testing uh, through our uh, contact with the Quest. And we will follow up, uh, we will provide uh, all the resulting, whether negative results, uh, and for those with positive, uh, we will be having a phone follow-up and nurse, our nurses will be uh, providing that care in partnership with the local Board of Health. Ensure folks will be coming through the the, uh, the our protocol to ensure a positive test. Is it really a, a real positive test, and whether this person will be uh, finally uh, uh, with a later TB infection, or with the, with the, or if it or whether it's a TB disease. And in either cases, there will be a follow up and care. Uh, the information uh, will uh, not necessarily will be uh, 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 shared with the with the public because this is a, for us as, as regular work. Uh, but we will be answering any question that anyone have concerns, whether it's from parents or, or from um, uh, uh, from uh, any any stakeholders or concerned uh, citizens. Definitely, we are we will be providing a response and. Uh, uh, fully transparency based on the information available. Uh, just kind of uh, giving you uh, more factors uh, to ensure for, for us that we have the full picture. We really need to 
go through uh, a detailed investigation and uh, so try to find the, the level of that and uh, um, assuring there is the the uh, for those with the uh, su sus suspected cases that they will have the really full uh, uh, different samples of sputum being taken and nucleic acid uh, uh, genetic testing will be done as well as sensitivity, as I mentioned before, to ensure that folks will be freely uh, receive the care needed. So, so if a diagnosis does that answer your came, question? Well, if a diagnosis came through today, would you uh, notify the parents tomorrow, close the schools? What exact steps? What what would happen? We will work uh, with the with the. Uh, local partners uh, protocol because this is uh, at the first is local partner protocol because it's uh, it, it is within within jurisdiction and we provide the guidance so there is a there isn't a standard a statewide uh, policy about it but uh, I think it overall is the really timely uh, follow up but when you have accurate information so we cannot uh, provide contact people and increase apprehension without us having the facts correct. We just need to make sure that, but the most most of the time, I think it's, it's timely and could be within 24 hours. So you would notify the Yarmouth Board of Health and then the Yarmouth Board of Health would it's notify? By, it's it usually is vice versa, but, but it is in general. I think it's uh, in, in either way, whenever the uh, the we've been notified whether through the uh, positive test, uh, for example, or through to a report from a healthcare provider, or from the local board of health. We work closely together to ensure uh, about uh, our uh, uh, common approach and uh, who will do the next step. But uh, all in all, all the information available, we have uh, our uh, draft letters that are available to parents. Uh, we have all these templates available and sometimes uh, so for example uh, in different jurisdiction they prefer that uh, they they will take uh, the the uh, control on that other jurisdictions they prefer that the state will uh, have the fi uh, first response so in any case we provide that response and i'm assuring you in these kind of events really really fast response and our teams are working tirelessly to ensure the information are accurate and available to those who need it first. Thank you. And following up on uh, the email, the Duffy email, it's you know reported that it contains more information, but can't be read. And the local representatives and Senator Sear won't respond without a FOIA request. Can you think of any reason why? In such, okay. you know, you've discussed this, and it's, it's, you know, certainly we don't want any TB, but you've explained it in a, you know, the, the process and how everything's done. Why they wouldn't respond with uh, this email? Yeah, can you say who would didn't respond again? I, I think I Senator I got, Senator yeah. Sear, yeah. who represents Cape yeah, Cod. So so really, I cannot speak on behalf of the representative office. I think uh, they are uh, going through their own policy. But uh, even us, for example, our response in, in this, we work closely with our communication folks, and we go uh, through our own protocol. So I cannot speak uh, to that. Uh, but as far as the information that we have as, as a mission, it will be really available readily to all of our stakeholders to ensure there is a timely response. Great. And Mary, given you the unique you um, yes. I wanted to make one contact, uh, one comment. Sorry, about tuberculosis. It's it's not easily spread. It requires close contact over a fairly long period, period. of yep. time. So yep. when we talk about contacts, we're not just talking about walking by somebody or driving by the hospital or being in the school building. Just just to qualify that, the contacts doesn't mean anybody that had anything to do with that space could be Thank you so much. Um, yeah. in, at risk. Very good point. Thank and, you so much. Definitely. And, and given the unique situation we're facing right now um, with the, the housing and everything, communication with the public is important, don't you think? 
definitely there's no question about it and um and then what uh what do you think is more dangerous uh, tuberculosis or covid-19 i would say it, it depends on so many different factors because you have you can have the same the same microorganism or the same virus and your body will react differently even if you have uh, uh, two subject with uh, very healthy subject they don't have conditions their body will respond differently but add to that in so many different factors that people could have for example they are overweight or they have uh, diabetes or they have uh, chronic renal failure or they have another immune conditions that not been yet uh, diagnosed so all that it's it's different so really uh, you cannot answer that uh, uh 100 percent accurately so i think it depends on the subject okay well thank you for your information it just seems having lived we all lived through it the hipaa rules involving covid didn't seem to be followed as closely and just with what's going on now uh, the public if given that this apparently happened was diagnosed or these four people at the end of November I just it would have been you know I think better and the public would understand it if this were if this information were passed on you know weeks ago several weeks ago but I thank you for the information and for um, providing me the time to ask the questions yeah welcome thank you okay Jay, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I would like to just uh, comment. Christopher, thanks for that comment. I, I do have to reiterate, this is the eighth meeting that the Board of Health has talked about uh, the migrant um, population, the program coming in. Every single meeting, the Board has asked for an update. As a matter of fact, at the last meeting, if you, I'd encourage you to watch this, because a lot of the information is was actually, was talked about, and, and this is, Somewhat, I think we have better clarification on this because the medical experts here. But uh, Christopher, to your point of community messaging, I couldn't agree more. But this board has 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 tried very hard, and tonight's meeting that I put together was to immunize the community with good information. With good information, you make good decisions, right? There's been a lot of concern, misinformation, and misinforming, and that that can result in fears. There's clearly things that we, that we want to pay attention to. Public health is a partner in this. The board is a partner in this. Every meeting they've asked, and it will continue. But the messaging piece for tonight and since September 10th, the board has talked about this. And some of the frustration is that people don't show up on this meetings because we talk about it. We talk about it regularly. We've talked about the National Guard. We've talked about meals. We've talked about transportation. It's gone on and on. So we have been, we've been trying to communicate and like I say, to immunize the community so you don't have these fears. You're going to hear in a little bit about the septic system. Okay, that, that, that was mis, misinformation that people were talking about. We monitor that regularly. But we, you do have an important speaker coming up and it's the, the site coordinator. She is there every single day, and I think she's going to provide some very good information to give you an op operational oversight of the program. Jay, just one more comment about communication. The town manager also has had regular um, updates on the website, and he is the official uh, spokesperson for the, the whole... Um, Thank you, Mary. A number of... It, it, in between, intermittently of your meetings, right. probably, I'm going to say close to 10 press releases, the town manager, thank you on that reminder, sure, when information was necessary became, and there's been a shift. Um, and again, this is a very fluid process. I think in one of his press releases, he, he talked about, we, said, we used the word approximately 75, and it, it was criticized. I say, well, how many, how many are there? Well, quite frankly, it's a very fluid, this, this is a very fluid process. One day there could be 75, the next day there could be 71. It, it gives scale that it's not 50 at the time. Now, today, there's 115. 115 in, uh, individuals there uh, consisting of about 30, 32 families. Now, might some people move on next week? We don't know, but we're going to give you some information, and that's what we did on December 4th, our last meeting. I think this is a good 
I think is important. It's been productive, and it's thrilled that people show up to ask questions because with good information you make good decisions, right? And and you'll all have your own approach on this, but this is factual. And Doc, I can't thank you enough. Meg Payne, others, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And, uh, uh, we have one more person back here. Sure, why don't you come forward? Thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, I understand it's a very difficult situation that we're in. How might we, moving forward, um, be able to get this information once it is out there, like these senators and so forth were sent this information, but yet you people were not, and clearly this is where it should have gone to. Um, any ideas on how we might move forward with that? To be honest with you, it's anecdotal that at least I've received that there's even this email I've talked about, I've heard about, just listening to the media or maybe people coming to our desk, emails that I get, individuals. And I, I go, I'm going to be honest with you, I get emails and return voice messages and things. Well, one of them, people are very concerned. And once I'm able to unravel some of the information there, I, I've actually received to say, I apologize that I had, the perception that I had, you are, this is working together with the community, working together with the board, right. when they had the information. Right. How best on the email piece, I, I am not, well, I don't, not just, I, I'm not anecdotally just, even uh, know that. Me, it's not just the email, it was a document that was coming from a facility. Yeah. And I would make, it seems to me that you people would be the people that. They didn't share it with us, I can right. tell you that. They right. didn't share it with the so board, how, and they didn't so share it with So how can we, like, make sure that that doesn't happen again. It's difficult when it's an outside department yeah, or agency right. that's outside of, of Yarmouth. Right. But I mean, it's, 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 our, it's our representatives who aren't sharing that information either. Yeah. Unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you do. Okay. If I may, for those of you who don't know, all of the Board of Health meetings are on the website and can be easily accessed review all the conversations prior to this meeting, along with any other committee that's there. Could you repeat that at the mic so people could hear it at home? Thank you. Well, my name is Paul Chaff. I'm the Director of uh, Technology for the Town of Yarmouth. For those who don't know, you can go back and see all of the Board of Health meetings by simply going on to the, uh, the website, and they're all recorded and they're all available to, to grab. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, we have another speaker here, which is great. We have the uh, site coordinator that's over at Harbor Side Suites, and that's a, a Miss Kimball, who's been waiting a long time. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for coming in. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to say um, how grateful I am to be able to come here and kind of share a little bit with you guys about, you know, the day to day of these people. But before I do that, I just want to say thank you to um, the town of Yarmouth, um, the outpour of love and support that the people at the harbor side have been receiving has been phenomenal. Um, as a resident of Cape Cod, it's and I've been able to help with other sites as well throughout um, the whole Cape Cod region. It's been wonderful to see the love that has been given to Harborside and in return extended to other hotels as well. So I just want to say thank you to the town of Yarmouth because it's, it's truly been a wonderful, wonderful um, outpour and wonderful um, way of kind of seeing the humanitarian within people um, of this town and, you know, of Cape Cod in general um, overall. So to kind of give you guys a little overview of what this entails, so as some of the people alluded, when these hotels are identified, so within 24 hours, the health department is place there and I am also I'm there to meet these migrants right away to just orient them to the town that they're in so this is why being from Cape Cod has been really helpful because I have the background to be able to kind of help them out to say you know this is your local area here trying this and kind of helping to navigate them throughout the whole process um, we have had so many support throughout the Cape um, these people they receive about 
two meals a day, which has been facilitated throughout with different vendors um, throughout the Cape that has been helping them out with that. And then also, um, we've been really blessed with some volunteers that has done um, ESL within the hotels for them, for the migrants. So we have these retired teachers who come into the hotel. We have about, like they do it four days a week. They provide about two hours worth of ESL classes for the parents. We also have a play group that is run three days a week for the younger children that are currently not in school, um, which has been phenomenal as a place for the parents to interact with the kids, but also to kind of understand um, how to provide that support to their children and having that like outlet as well too. We also have a volunteer that comes into the hotel that does um, knitting with the people, um, and just kind of really helping the community to feel connected. We've had an outpour of people who's come in to donate clothes, people who have called me, not even from the Cape. I have people who just used to reside on the Cape and just hear about these migrants have been able to kind of provide support in any way that these migrants might want. So it's been really a wonderful um thing to be part of and I am so grateful that I've been able to be part of this and there has been so many different things that has happened throughout the time that they've been there within the three months so it's been pretty phenomenal um what, what yeah if anyone um, has any like specific questions what kind of we can definitely are you facing them. what difficulties are we facing yes um, as of right now, I would say there hasn't been really much of a difficulties that I'll say this town um, has faced just in regards to the minute the migrants arrived, we had the superintendent sent out um, someone that coordinates within the town that um, did all of like the schoolings for the children of uh, school age children, which some of the other towns didn't get that same support here. Um, we've had people from the first week that they were there that has come to donate things to them. So we haven't really faced a whole lot of challenges relating to them being placed here. comments or questions we have we have one up there or not yes one. Gail. is Gail's up okay there we go yes Gail I'm um, hi can you hear me yes okay so what is the um, payback from the state that Harbor Suites is getting for this um, housing effort What do you mean in regards to payback? Like how you get paying for this? How are, how you, are you paying for this? Um, how is the state paying for this? So is well, through how the state are you funding. paying for this? Yeah. Or am I? Or I'm I'm not paying for it. For like in regards to the migrants being on the Cape, am I yeah, paying so for it? For the housing, for the laundry, for the food. Who's paying for this? Linda, would you like me to jump in? Yes, please. Hi, Karen Molesky again from uh, the Department of Public Health's yeah. um, Office of Preparedness and Emergency Management. So as I had mentioned earlier, the Emergency Assistance Program and this um, sheltering support is done through the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Um, so they have the, the contracts with the sites. And how long is this contract um, for at Harborview? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I have no idea. Who would know? The Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Okay. And um, who owns Harborview? Does someone know who owns, who is the owner, proprietor of Harborview, of Harbors, whatever? What is it, Harborview? Who's the proprietor? Sure. Gail, Jay Gardner, um, we would have that. I don't have that off the top of my head, but we ha would have that on our uh, on our records at both the buildings department and the health department. 
Okay, so the building department and the health department would have that information on who owns the facility. Is we, that correct? We were clear whether it's a sole proprietor corporation or I, I don't I don't have it off the, in front of me or off the top of my head, but we could certainly get ownership information. We would have okay, that in our then, records. And that again, and then how long? I mean, this was was Harborview or is it Harborview Suite? Har Harbor whatever. Harbor. Yeah. Now, what was that prior to? um this becoming a facility uh to uh uh provide services for this group of people what was that what was the business um at that point i, I don't have a long tenure here on the cape two years so i, I th i've heard it referred to as and i correct me if i'm wrong brentwood hotel is that uh, brentwood okay. i believe that that was it brentwood so and, it was a hotel. and hotel yeah so it was functioning as a as a hotel clearly it's just a no, so I'm, now has has that changed or like how like at the end of like does it become a hotel when tourists come back to the cape for for this season yeah i honestly i i don't i don't know that i don't know that and then who would know that please i, I think can that's can i jump be, in there with, yeah sure yeah, yeah so initially the state um, dealt with Harborside. We, the town of Yarmouth, had nothing to do with right. uh, Harborside and and the contract that the state has with Harborside. So you'd have okay. to, uh, I'd have to, well, we'd have to ref, uh, refer you back to the state uh, to answer those questions. But you, as a, a, a representative of, of the town of South Yarmouth, would you not have curiosity in terms of being able to understand that relationship? Well. From the standpoint of the Board of the Health, um, it seems to be beyond the scope of our purview. Right. I mean, it's okay. our responsibility as a board is uh, to protect the health of people who are living in Yarmouth um, and people uh -huh. visiting as well. I mean, that's what our responsibility is here. Yes. Okay, that's the scope of your responsibility. So then we, you would refer us back to the town proper of South Yarmouth to then understand um, the relationship for these other questions, is that correct or not? I, I can I can tell you um, at some early meetings, and I've been I've been at most of them of uh, the selectmen's meeting when early on when this when this all broke. This is now early September. Some of you were probably there, and there were questions asking the selectmen, and they tried very hard to get what the contracts. What they're fully transparent. They didn't have the information. They. Uh, they they didn't know themselves so you're trying to dive down into the what's the contract with harborside suites mm -hmm. right yeah i yes. i yeah. i don't know i know the select mode trying to get and the town administrator was get, trying to get that as well that goes back some time huh so you don't have it I, I, so you i don't know uh, and so you as the board of health do would you not have a concern because being the board of health <coughs> as having um a really vital uh responsibility to the um the residents in, of t of south yeah. yarmouth would you not have to have a concern on this in terms of to understand the structural relationship as it impacts the board of health so so the um financial arrangement you know uh, this is an emotionally charged issue immigration issues national and beyond that that's well beyond the margins of the discipline of public health. I think the chairman said it well and a couple of the members. This is the health, the safety um, of the residents, the visitors, and the environment. And, and beyond that, that, that is beyond this board's scope. So the, the board is like now, right now, is, it's my understanding, and correct me if, my, if I am wrong, but the Board of Health now has an open-ended situation with this. And in terms of monitoring for public health, then am I correct or not? I I, I don't. We say open ended. I'm, I'm not sure. Like, what's the contract with Harborside Suites? Is it open ended? Uh, we don't know that. If if someone is living here in town, uh, visiting long term or short term, this board uh, looks to make sure that the health office is making sure the quality of life um, they're well protected, um, they have access to resources and they have an opportunity to thrive. That's what public health does as a discipline. That's what we deliver. We deliver services. And residents come and go in this community. I mean, 
we have seasonal. Come and population. go, meaning. Come and go, meaning. Meaning we have visitors, summer population, right. people come and go. Right. Right. Yeah. So at this point, we don't have a definitive endpoint, or we don't have any parameter to say that at some time point in time on the go forward that this situation this situation is going to con according to my understanding is just going to go it's fluid it's ongoing with no definitive structure in place in terms of on the future that's my understanding and once again mm -hmm. the board of health is responsible for the people who are living here it's not our decision of what the plan is for the state where people are going to hear, we have to take care of them, okay? No, and that's true of all of us living here or visiting. So I really want to keep this uh, meeting focused on health issues. Yes, and then my other health question is one of the, uh, the board members um, made the comment that TB is, takes a long time or a period of time in order to uh, be ex with exposure for a potential to become infected and i would like that board member to provide me with that number that time period okay i, I don't think we're not, we're here as volunteers okay we're not here as clinicians i think it's important for you to realize that we have experts on tonight i think the board member was just trying to say it's a little bit different with TB uh, than it is with COVID of walking by someone in a supermarket. I think that was the essence of the comment. Right, but I just need to understand what her concept, if she can answer that question for me, what is I, her concept I, of my, my background longer? is the communicable disease supervisor for the city of Virginia Beach, and uh -huh. tuberculosis control was part of my responsibility. Um, okay. And so I'm speaking from a little bit of knowledge um, that and, and a whole lot of contact tracing, um, a whole lot of exposure in schools and nursing homes or long-term care facilities, um, correctional facilities. Um, and I was just trying to um, assuage some of the fear that tuberculosis is not easily communicated. It has to be contact, close contact with a, a symptomatic person over a period of hours. And I'm sorry I can't quantify that because it's all, it, it's again individual. And that's why mm -hmm. um, Meg does that contact tracing, does that further investigation once she gets a report. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I have one more question. Are there any other hotels or motels um, that are accommodating these um, illegal aliens at this point besides the harbor suites not in your Did you say did you say contemplating i heard i missed a word there accommodating accommodating i'm sorry i thought i said contemplate uh, no um the harborside suites is the only uh okay. hotel in in town okay yep okay, okay. Margaret. Who oh, no, I'll go one more thing uh, i think just to uh, correct the term here uh these are considered migrants not illegal aliens uh, they are good. illegal they are illegal okay i don't think we're going to go down the the political uh thank line you, here Larry. okay but thank you for the correction okay margaret you've had your hand up you've been very patient they are illegal oh hi thank you um hi. this i want to focus back on the woman i did not catch her name i apologize who is the coordinator with the harborside migrants and she described some really great benefits that they're getting that you know the health screening two meals a day and daycare and i'd like to know if the residents of the shelters and the people that are on the list for shelter are getting the same benefits the food two days two times a day health care screening and daycare for their kids thank you so I just want to clarify, they're not getting daycare um, for their kids. So it's a play group. So um, it's a 
play group where they come and they provide, they just spend time with the children and the parents are still there with the children for about an hour. So it is not um, full daycare that they're getting. And the reason why they are getting these meals is because they are living in a hotel. So they are unable to prepare their own meal, which I'm sure they would prefer. Um, but they're unable to prepare meals because they're living in a hotel. So which is why um, these meals are Under provided. Understood. And I appreciate that. My question is that the people that are not in, residing in the harbor side, but are residing in emergency shelters or are on waiting lists and they're living in their cars on in tents or on the streets, are they getting two meals a day? Are they getting play groups? And are they getting shelter? Um, that's not something I can really answer as I'm only working with the migrants that are currently located at the harbor side. Yeah, I thank you. I, I, I guess my question, I should have directed at the state and at the board that they would know the answer. I, I really honestly didn't expect you to know that answer, but thank you for trying to answer it. But so state and board members, if you could answer my question. Margaret, um, there is a fact sheet about emergency assistance program in Massachusetts that is extremely detailed and it includes emergency assistance for for other people than migrants, um, primarily families and, and pregnant um, women. So y you might go ahead and access that and I think it might answer your question. Thank you, Mary. And you can access that on, on the website for the town, okay? It's very detailed. Thank you. And I, I don't want to be argumentative, but that's not something that you can answer right now. Right. Those details, no, we can't provide that to you right now. Okay. And the state rep that is on the, on the line can't provide answers to that either statewide? not just Yarmouth, but statewide. Uh, could you uh, just repeat that question, the original question? Margaret? Trying to unmute, sorry about that. Yeah, my original question is the benefits and the care that the migrants are getting at Harborside include two meals a day, which I understand. They don't have access to kitchens, so they have to have the meals. They're getting play groups, they're getting health screening. And my question is, for those that are living in emergency shelters, those that are on the waiting list for shelters, and those people are living, some are living in their cars, and they're living in tents, are they getting two meals a day? Are they getting health screening? And are they getting play groups for their children? So that fact sheet that was mentioned <clears throat> is uh, answers those um, questions. It, the first three paragraphs of that fact sheet will answer those questions for you. Uh, if you want me to read them okay, to you. Okay, thank you. If, okay. No, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll trust you and I'll look at it. And thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. Okay, please come forward. I just wanted to ask some safety questions that I have about the site. Um, I drive by it quite regularly, and a few observations I've had are, number one, there are an awful lot of children that are playing in a parking lot. Um, that seems kind of dangerous to me, um, especially small children who may run and chase after balls that go running astray. Um, it's located on a busy road. Route 28 is very highly trafficked. Um, I also see the residents of the harbor side walking to get to wherever they need to go, whether it's across the street over to the dollar store, the Stop and Shop, the Shaw's. Um, there is no crosswalk in that area. Um, I, and I know <laughs> there's a lot of times when I'm driving and I'm, I'm being a little extra cautious as I'm going by um, because there are people walking and I just happen to be aware of that situation. I know there's people that drive by that aren't aware of what's happening over there. Um, people, you know, pushing shopping carts, walking up and down the street. I think that's, you know, dangerous too. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to touch on a point. Um, I believe, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot her name, <laughs> the site coordinator. Um, she made a comment about not having cooking ability within the hotel, and that's why they're being provided meals. Um, I've been in the Shaw's and the Stop and Shop, and I've seen the shopping carts and the 
goods that they're purchasing. Um, I've seen things like heads of cabbage and potatoes and all kinds of things that, you know, somebody like me, if I was staying in a hotel, would not be purchasing to cook within a hotel room. Um, so I have a safety concern there as far as, you know, how are these foods being prepared um, on site within the hotel if there's no proper cooking? Yeah. Cheryl, I, I, I can't speak specifically to the... Uh, to uh, where they're cooking their uh, their groceries, but I can tell you from the building department, the fire department, and the health department, we've gone through just for safety. We're looking at smoke detectors, right? We're looking at a number of different things, hot plates. The concern, like yourselves, we have the same. Where they're cooking those groceries, I don't. Do they have friends? Do they have a a, a faith-based group or a church group or a commissary that they're working out of? Perhaps I, I I can't speak intelligently as to where they're cooking their cabbage, but. Um, I do know there there is some facility. I think there's microwave. There might be some cooking in the lobby that may be available, um, but w our safety concerns are, are are the same to make sure that you know smoke detectors are in place that they haven't been been uh, disarmed, and um, the hot plates and things of that day. The fire department, the building department, and uh, the health department have gone through several times to ensure that. And and quite frankly, there's a manager on site 24/7. And uh, and he is that individual is very responsive as well. And the other one we haven't touched upon, but you're going to hear about it soon, is the National Guard. There's four National Guard there. Uh, I, I should have picked up on your first issue uh, with the children. I saw that in September. Not so much now, but the kids and uh, things of that nature of uh, their safety. And one of my first visits was the pool is being uh, renovated. Right? It's empty. It's an empty pool, and we had to make sure that because renovations are going on there, so. Nothing's more inviting than a pool but unless it doesn't have any water. And so we had to secure that, make sure that site was so, so full attention to make sure that the children who are very young, it's uh, making sure that it's a safe place. It, there's not a playground there. You're absolutely right. Uh, the dumpster area to make sure that's clean. We're making sure that that's being properly maintained, fenced off uh, before Thanksgiving, yeah. making sure that, you know, there was going to be uh, the, the, the removal company would probably be uh, delayed in doing that. We, we expedited uh, service to the dumpster area. We want to make sure that is clean, so refuse and things of that nature. Um, I think what Linda tried to, and I, Linda, I very much appreciate you being there to, to talk about this, to say uh, there's a lot of eyes between the four uh, National Guard folks, and quite frankly, the board has gone over and spoke to the National Guard. This has their full attention. Believe me, we're, they're working very hard to make, as, as we do, we go over probably every several, every couple days, you're going to hear Barry Lewis next, the assistant director, who's just not feeling well, and, uh, but he's going to be speaking about that, him going over there on a regular basis. Those have, we have the same concerns, attention, as yourself. I, mean, I was there one day, and the National Guard was putting up, not that's heroic, but they were putting up a, a clothesline for individuals. There was a concern that uh, residents were saying, oh, they're hanging clothes out on, the, on, on chairs and things like that. Well, they had no place to put them. So they're out and back, they put up a clothesline for them. Little things, it seems like a small thing, but quite frankly, it's accommodating and they don't have much. They're living in a 15 by 15 room. There's not much. Okay, and then, uh, maybe we can move ahead then. Um, Barry Lewis, our, assist, our assistant director of health, uh, can bring us up to date on some issues over there. Okay, at Harbor Suites. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good evening. Thank you, Chairman, for letting me join in. Thank you, uh, Director Gardner. Sorry, I couldn't be there live in person. Um, the septic system. We've had questions. We got calls about the septic system being in failure. The septic system is not in failure. The construction that is going on. And the parking lot has nothing to do with the septic system. The Harbor Side Suites are putting in four charging stations for electric cars. So has nothing to do with the septic system. The septic system is brand new. It was put in in May 2023, even prior to them knowing that they were going to get any kind of um, migrants or anything. They just voluntarily upgraded their system because it was a new owner and they knew it needed to be upgraded, which is the town appreciates that. The septic system has five different systems. It can retain, it can hold 6,660 gallons per day of flow. I reached out to the water department. The average daily flow at the Harbor Day, at the Harborview Suites is only 3,166. So they're way below the capacity of what that septic system can handle. 
So there's no issue with the septic system at the at the site. Uh, speaking of safety, I have also reached out to the Yarmouth PD. I was just curious a number of calls that have gone into Yarmouth PD and Yarmouth Fire Department. Since September 1st, there's, only, there's been 13 calls to the Harborside Suites. Only two of them are validated. And those were both responded to by fire department. Um, one was a child fell off a bike, and I'm not for sure what the other one was. So there's no, and that goes back to the, to the National Guard being there. They patrol, they have schedules, they walk around. They don't, I don't want to say they patrol, they go and talk to people. They get their input, what they need. They help people. I see them helping, carrying their lunches to their rooms and stuff like that. The National Guard's amazing. I, I try to go around lunchtime. And when they're saying they're getting meals, I'm not talking school cafeteria meals. They're getting full-blown three-course meals, milks, juices. Each room gets, I mean, this, um, when I was there Friday, they were getting two large pizzas per room. It's, they're, 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 they're doing pretty good over there. Um, when I go there, the residents are extremely polite. They smile. They, they recognize me now. They smile and wave at me. Um, and I, and the health department and the board has a great rapport with the National Guard, who again is on site, patrolling everything. They, uh, we had an organization reach out for Christmas dinner, a uh, church that would like to remain anonymous, that would like to supply uh, Christmas dinner. I reached out to the National Guard, said, "Hey, can you go door to door and ask how many people would be there? Some of them might be going to services as uh, together." And all of them said that they would like to be have a community uh, dinner, Christmas dinner. So stuff like that is amazingly that's going on over there. It's 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 nice. Um, I don't know what they're buying at the grocery stores. I can't tell you that. So, but they're they're doing good. So overall, septic system is nowhere near failure. Brand new, designed by Title Five um, State Massachusetts codes, and it's up to date. So, thank you. Any questions? Uh, yes, looks like Christopher has a question. Unmute, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for the septic update. Um, how is the uh, motel heated? The motel heated? I. That's a great, great question. I've never. It. It just about from that. the outside. Yeah. It doesn't look well insulated, and it has window units installed in the walls, which right. at least it just, I'm just wondering, you know, is it really uh, heated for the winter? Uh, I'm not, I can't see through the walls, so I can't tell you that. Uh, okay. That would be a building issue, a building question and concern. But if there wasn't a major concern, the building would have already addressed it, so. Okay. And then just, I don't know if the Board of Health is involved with this, but the select board said at the last meeting, the um, Zoning Board of Appeals on January 11th, 2024, has an appeal with the owner of Harbor Suites and um, that they are in violation, they were found in violation, and so they are appealing that decision, and that's before the Zoning Board in January. I will let uh, Director Gardner take that question, please. Just Chris, okay, that's correct. You. That's actually in uh, the town administrator's last uh, press release that came out, I believe, last week. Uh, the closing comment uh, was ad addresses exactly that, um, and that would be handled by our building commissioner. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Any other questions for me? Anyone? Uh, if not, I think we'll, we'll close that uh, section of the, of the meeting. Okay, we'll move ahead. Uh, third item is new and old business for the Board of Health. Just any, Anyone? Uh, one point I'll make on uh, new business is just that COVID is, is spiking. Um, there's a new sub-variant, it's called JN1. And that certainly is having, it's just spreading quickly. Um, and RSV is spiking as well. So it's not too late to get your COVID vaccination as well as your RSV and your COVID vaccinations. I would encourage you to do so. And the flu. 
it's Thank not. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate hearing from people. We really do. And for your interest and concern. In the other new rural business, I know it's, it's 8 o'clock. Everyone's been very patient here. Okay, if not, it's time to adjourn. If someone wants to make a motion. I make a motion to get out of Dodge. Second, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. aye. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.